we go. Welcome back to the second hour of our class. This uh, will be a search for our secret of the Christian spiritual life, lesson 46, and spiritual warfare, uh, lesson 17b, I believe where we are now in that, uh, that sequence. Uh, the slide we left off with last hour is slide 40, slide 40. Uh, so I'll review it after we pray. So yeah, let's just go ahead and pray right now and then I'll review it. Father Yahweh, we ask for blessings in this hour that, that the things we learn in this hour will be manifest in our lives both uh, as we leave behind our human good nature and adapt our spiritual nature, the fruit of the spirit and usabaya, uh, that we will provide love in a way that is not demanding of reciprocity uh, as, as human good love is, a desire to gain something that we can love without any desire to gain, that we can love to demonstrate your love and the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, the slide we left off with last hour, using our example of type two again, we see the secondary fear that their own needs and negative feelings will harm their relationships. In other words, once type twos have established the self-image of being loving, selfless people, in the hope of getting love, they begin to fear ever being unloving or selfish, whatever that may mean to them. Certain real feelings that they may have will contradict their self-image, and the result will be more anxiety. Okay? When your feelings are telling you something, you are going to listen. Right? Very difficult. That's, that's, that's why... I, uh, Paul says to the Corinthians, you are serving your bellies. The bellies are uh, where the emotions are. Kidneys and, and bellies in Hebrew language, uh, Hebrew con culture, were the seats of the emotions. That's where the emotions were. And, and he says, you're, you're serving your bellies, your emotions. Right? Because emotions will try to control you. And, and uh, the teaching that uh, uh, we learned 40 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, uh, emotional revolt, that your emotions will revolt against your soul because they want preeminence. And but emotions are to be responders. It's the relationship of a man and a woman is that the woman is the more emotional. She's the responder to the man's, to the man, okay? And so emotions should be responders. If they become rebellious and try to take over, then disharmony and discord ensue. Just like in a marriage, if the woman tries to take over as the head of the family, then there's going to be discord and disharmony. That because they are analogous to the emotional uh, in us, in our, see, emotions are not in our soul. Emotions are in our body. You can, uh, emotions are in the brain. That's not your soul. The brain is not your soul. Your soul is invisible, but your emotions are in your brain. And that's why when we get to heaven, we're not going to be sad about things left behind or people uh, left behind because emotions will, will disappear with our bodies when we go to heaven and leave our bodies behind. So it's important to understand that emotions aren't the real you. Now, appreciation is. See, we love God with our soul. If you're loving God with your amygdala, then you have a phony religion. You don't have true relationship with god if you you know you have these people oh, i just love god so much i just want to give him a kiss okay you're a phony okay you have no spiritual depth 
you don't understand. Uh, that's, that's the kind they are. The, the mushy gushy love, uh, emotional love uh, is not the kind of love for God. We love God because he first loved us. Did he love us with his emotions? No, he loved us out of his will. What does it say love is? Love is patient, love is kind, love, it doesn't say love is giddy, love is, is silly doesn't say that. Okay, where were we? We won't even get one slide if I don't hurry up. Um, all right, I finished that one. Let's move on. If a type succumbs to this secondary fear, they must reinforce their self-image with definite behavior. Okay? So, so I've got to do things that prove that I am supportive or I am loving, or I am, you know, whatever, whatever the secondary fear is, they have to develop behavior to counteract that so that they can convince themselves what they are, what they want to be. Okay, so this is represented by the arrow leading from the secondary fear at level two, diagonally down to the secondary desire at level three. Subsequently, another layer of ego is established, strengthening and reinforcing the one at level two, but at the price of less freedom and greater anxiety because they know it's not true, right? So they went down. to level three, okay, we saw that, I, I jumped ahead when I was talking about level two, I went to level three, where they, where their self images I'm giving. Uh, my at, their attitude is I'm supportive, their self images, I'm a giving person. Generous, encouraging, helpful, expressive, guiding, serving. Okay. Well, what's that's going to lead to? It's going to lead to another fear. That what are, whatever they have been doing for others is not enough to gain their love. That, that others aren't going to come to them. They're going to have to go out and find somebody to convince. It's basically what it is. To put it in... in crude terms, they're going to have to go out and find people uh, to love, to satisfy their self-image, to satisfy their approbation desire. Okay. So that, that new fear that whatever they've been doing for others is not enough, they got to find more people, where are they going to go now? Level four, the imbalanced level um, and they're going to go to, uh, they want to be wanted. Remember I touched on that last hour as I skipped ahead. They're going to want to be wanted. And they're going to have an attitude of being well-intentioned. They're still well-intentioned. They're not evil people. I mean, they, they're evil in the sense that they're walking uh, in, the, in their uh, human nature from Adam, which is good and evil but they're not, they're not malicious people, okay? So they're well-intentioned, sentimental, solicitous, familiar. Uh, they need physical contact. That's, that's the demonstrative that I talked about last hour, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, move into the discussion of that. As you may recall from the description on page two of this appendix, level three is still healthy, but it's clearly within the world of ego. At this level, each type engages in constructive behavior to prove to itself and others that it really possesses the qualities delineated by their self-image. See, behavior is a way of justification, self-justification. But I, and, and if you ask people, uh, well, I go back to our witnessing uh, scenario, people say, I, but I, I am a good person. I do such and such, such and such. Their behaviors are what they use to justify their self-image. 
looking again at type two, we see that if two succumb, if two succumb to the secondary fear at level two, that their own needs and negative feelings will harm their relationships, they turn to the compensating secondary desire of level three. We've already looked at that, seeking to, go, to do good things for others to reinforce their positive feelings and self-image. Face it, people, when we, when we do something good for people, we get an emotional rush of dopamine, okay? It makes us feel good about ourselves. And, and phony religion will do that. We'll teach people that, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to do this good thing. Okay. And, and because you're going to feel good about it uh, because you've done it because it releases dopamine in your brain. Okay. But that's not, that's not love from the Holy spirit. It can be love from a human perspective. And what is that? approbation motivation for reciprocation so that others will reciprocate and and be loving toward us or act loving toward us okay all right so so this level three seeking to do good this leads to the a, a term the attitude term of being supportive uh, which is appreciative sympathetic nurturing and then to the b term the behavior of giving and that's their self self-image i'm a giving person but note that at level three, in all subsequent levels, the A term represents attitudes or internal states of consciousness, which are generally invisible to other people. Our attitudes, our self-image, starting now, are not obvious to others. They are an internal expression. The B term represent behaviors, actions, or styles of expression, self-expression, which generally are visible to other people. Thus, attitudes like those of type two at level three, supportive, appreciative, and sympathetic, are expressed in specific behavior described in the B terms at level three of giving, encouraging, being helpful, and so forth. Of course, once a person becomes identified with the behaviors and attitudes at level three, they too must be defended. That's me. I can't, I can't I've got to be me. Okay. And I'd sing it if I could causing yet another fear to arise. This again is represented by the arrow arcing right from the B term column back to the fear column. In the case of type two being helpful, generous and encouraging causes a new fear that whatever they have been doing for others is not enough to gain their love. Others will not come to them. They must go out to others. If a type succumbs to the fear at level three, they will pursue a compensating desire at level four. I've already covered that. Uh, leading to yet another cluster of attitudes and behaviors, which must also be defended, thus causing new fears and so on. The entire process then repeats itself all the way down to level nine. By now, you may well be able to observe the spiral structure of the core dynamics. A fear sets a desire in motion, leading left to internal attitudes, then to external behaviors, then back around to a new fear and down to the next level to compensate for it. From this perspective, all ego development or disintegration, and I, I really have to do this. You see, in the Enneagram, it's called disintegra disintegration. Okay, what it should be called is disintegration. dish das das integration because it's not disintegrating it's not it's it's non-integrating because in the enneagram integrating is going to the positive side right? i call it deterioration because in our in our thinking process our self-image in our attitudes our behaviors it is deteriorating going down down and down How about that?
Okay, so. So we did level four, and then I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the level five to get into uh, one more, and then we're gonna go on, we're gonna leave our example. Because we've already done this with the level two, you can review it, all right. The level four, desire to be wanted, to be close to others, uh, the demonstrative, uh, flattering, flirtatious. You know, there's more to hug, more than just hugging. More than just hugging is involved with being demonstrative, okay? And, uh, but that leads to the people, the, the fear that the people they love will love someone else. That takes them to level five, okay? And their desire in level five is to be needed to make themselves necessary, okay? To make it so the person can't get along without you. Okay? So that's, that's the level five basic desire. I'm just gonna do the basic desires the rest of the way. Level six, the level of overcompensation, to be acknowledged, to have their virtue and goodness recognized. Level seven, the level of violation. This is where they're getting into now psychopathies, uh, the so sociopathic levels. To maintain the belief, this is their desire, to maintain the belief that they haven't done anything selfish or wrong. They want to hold on to people at all costs. Okay, And then they go to level eight, to get love from anyone any way they can. You see the, the potential for sexual uh, promiscuity there. The level nine, to vindicate themselves by falling apart and suffering. I can't do anything to get this affection. Now I'm going to become a basket case and people will take care of me. And I will take that as love. And of course, the, the basic fear is now realized that they have become unwanted and unlovable. Okay, so uh, by now you may well be able to observe the spiral structure. A fear sets a desire in motion leading left to internal attitudes, then to external behaviors, then back around to a new fear, down to the next level to compensate for it. From this perspective, all ego development or disintegration disintegration, deterioration, can be seen as moving up or down this spiral structure. See, the Enneagram wants you to move up. Um, if you turn to the example of type two again, you will see in the A term and B term columns, beginning at level four, the level of imbalance, an italicized word at the bottom of each cluster. These italicized words represent qualities from the type's direction of disintegration that begin to occur at level four. So if you look at your chart, the bottom of level four, attitudes, no nonsense, okay? Behavior, persuasive. Go to level five, interpersonal control. Now they're trying to control, they are now and their attitude self-centered and their behaviors, they're dominating. And uh, level six, uh, their attitude confrontational and their, their behavior undermining, okay? Level seven, their attitude vengeful, their behavior violent. It's when they start lashing out. Remember, when they talked about a type two, when we went through the descriptors to introduce you to all of these. And I've taken this through steps, basic introduction, a little more introduction, a little more detail, a little more to get you to this point so that we can start seeing the, the spiritual uh, uh, context, spirit, spiritual uh, revelations of these things as humans. And we can see that there are spiritual alternatives. And, and so then you get to uh, level eight, their, their attitude is no boundaries. And their, 
their uh, behaviors, predatory. And level nine, they become remorseless in attitude, destructive in behaviors. These are psychopaths. These are, these are either going to be emotional uh, wrecks or, they're become, they're, or the violence is gonna take over, okay? So those are the italicized words. Uh, thus, they serve as a reminder of the parallel track of the direction of disintegration and give an indication of attitudes and behaviors that will arise at each level during periods of heightened stress. Okay, so here is a chart that you have in your notes, but only probably, I don't think you have a whole page of it. Yeah, you do, you do. Okay, if, if you print it out the whole page, you have a page. This is the immature attitudes, uh, the, the nice way of saying it, and it goes for the, for the one. This is a good chart to have, good chart to, to memorize, uh, because this is how you're going to see people in their negativity. People are negative. This is the way they're going to be. The, the two is going to be dominating, symbiotic. The three, uh, well, I'll go, I'll go back to the two, manipulative, dominating, symbiotic. The three, opportunistic, deceptive, career addicted. The four, self-pitying, decadent, infatuated with death. The five, isolated, nihilistic, eccentric. The six, dependent, aggressive, cowardly. The seven, excessive, uh, dilettantish, opinionated. The eight, power obsessed, tyrannical, and violent. The nine, fatalistic, disoriented, and stubborn. Okay. So if you have any of these, I guess I better do the one, know-it-all, pharisaical, corrosive. Okay. If we have any of these descriptions, because these are the lower levels, we know that we have characteristics of, hum of our humanism, our humanity, that are deteriorated from what they could be. And that should give you a hint that you need spiritual resuscitation, be transformed by the renewing, the renovation of your thinking, okay? We need the book of Ephesians, okay? All of the, uh, all of the doctrine related to that, okay? All right. I'm gonna go ahead and do this because we're gonna run out of time anyway. Uh, looking at the structure as a whole, we can see that it is fear again and again that drives us deeper and deeper into restrictive, painful ego states and farther and farther from a direct experience of our true nature. What's the true nature he's talking about? Our human good nature is their emphasis in our sin nature. If, if you're a good human, if you're, if you're a uh, true human in the Enneagram, you're a, you're a human good person. Remember, human Enneagram is human viewpoint, not divine viewpoint, but human viewpoint. Okay? We can also see that children developing in dysfunctional environments will often have more fears to contend with and therefore more ego defenses layered on. Could be true in our case. I'm not real big on, on uh, the uh, Freudian concept of childhood is the reason you are the way you are. Um, there... Uh, well, I, I'm a, I had great parents. I, I recognize none of the, of the parental uh, uh, issues that they talk about uh, as a child. Uh, I had them as I as was an adult uh, with my parents uh, and with other people, but they, they weren't a childhood thing. You know, I had a loving mother, a loving father, a father that uh, did everything for me. My mother did everything for me. There was no, there was, there was no conflict uh, until I was about, yeah, probably not until I was about 18 or 19 before any real conflict ensued. Okay. So I don't, I don't 
subscribe. I, I know that there are people that their childhood was very, very negative and influenced them. So I see that that's part of what the Enneagram is talking about. It's not true in every case. Sometimes the things that shatter us happen in our thirties, like a divorce, like a, like a divorce can, can begin our downward spiral. It doesn't have to be childhood, okay. but it can be. Thus adults who are functioning in the lower end of the levels of development can be seen as individuals who as children were forced to develop more elaborate systems of defense. That may or may not be true. It then follows that the way to, and this is, this is the Enneagram human good. Is that what it says at the top of this section on your notes? Uh, I, I put it in one set of, the, I don't know if it's the one I ended up printing or not. It then follows that the way to lighten the burden of one's more painful defended states is to, is to follow the spiral up against the arrows. Now put the point of the arrow at the other end and go upward toward your self idealization, you know, self realization. That's human good. The way that we deal with any childhood or any other disasters in our life, any other false ego developments in our life is to let it go. Okay. Put off the old man and put on the new. But do not walk as the Gentiles walk, the unbelievers walk, but walk by means of the spirit. That takes care of that. Then you have, then, then you can forgive. You see, so hard for people to forgive their parents if they had a bad childhood or to forgive, let's, my example, forgive the spouse that ran off and left them. It's so hard to forgive that way. But with, in Christ, the fruit of the spirit, it's, you can forgive because why? We can forgive others because he first forgave us. We, we have that orientation that, okay, if, if he forgave me for all I did against him, I can forgive others for what they did against me. Okay. All right, this means allowing one's self experience at the fear, uh, experience to experience the fear at the level in which one finds oneself and all the subsequent fears above it. It also means allowing oneself to let go of the behaviors, attitudes, and desires that one may be clinging to by recognizing that there are more effective means to realize what one really wants, the basic desire. Our discussion then has led us back to the turning point at the basic desire of level two. If you recall, there are two arrows leading from the basic desire. The one that led left toward the A term leads into the world of ego, with all of the costs we have just described. The other arrow leads up to level I and a space marked self-actualization. This is becoming a saint in, in human terms. This means that if a person truly wants to achieve his basic desire, he must confront his basic fear at level I, but also let go of his self-image, the definition of himself formed at level two, seeing that it is not the whole truth of who they are. In other words, you must become a Buddhist or a, you know, and, uh, lose your ego, or you can become a drug addict. You know. Okay, here's where I put that. The human good recipe of the Enneagram. In the example of type two, this would mean that twos would need to confront their fear of being unwanted and unworthy of being loved, but also the self-image described under self-actualization, that they are not allowed to take care of themselves and their own needs. This frees the twos to acknowledge the full range of their feelings and motivations without seeing themselves as selfish. Yeah, you don't wanna see yourself as selfish, why? It leads to bad emotions, okay? Uh, leading to the A terms and the B terms, the level one, the level of liberation. The level of liberation is you've become a superhuman. Right? Level one, however, is not the end of the road, but the beginning of another. It's the beginning of the world of the true self, the essence, which is not defined in the ways that the ego is. Once a person has become liberated from the trap of his own personality type, he will begin to experience all kinds of wonderful impressions of themselves. Okay. You're going to learn to love yourself above everything else. Okay. 
the world and life. Moreover, such a person would be able to integrate the positive qualities of all nine types since they are no longer attached to behavior and beliefs connected with only one of them. You will become Jesus, your own God, your own Savior. That's basically what they're saying. There's actually a study I have not decided if I'm going to include it or not, but Jesus as the nine types, the, 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 the good of all the nine types. Uh, it's interesting, and I may, I may throw it in since we're already behind schedule. Okay, now go back to the first page of your notes. Very first page, the one you skipped all the way down to slide 25. And we'll get level three here anyway. I mean, personality type three, what I meant to say. Okay. So let's use what we've learned with our example of type two, our detailed example of type two. So what is the basic fear of type three? Of being worthless. What's type three's main characteristics? Hardworking, the succeeder, okay? The one who accomplishes things. So his basic fear is being worthless. Basic desire to feel valuable, to follow the, the diagonal layer, uh, arrow from basic fear to basic desire, to feel valuable and worthwhile because they disappoint others, they know that they disappoint others. Okay. So that's going to lead them to a, an attitude of being adaptable, other directed, realistic, self-assured, purposeful, with unlimited potential. And that's gonna result in the behaviors of desirable, attractive, charming, well-adjusted, poised, in other words, admirable. What did I, how did I describe the desire of a three, to be admired. Level two, what? To be appreciated for what they do. Level three, to be admired for what they do. Okay. So then, but that's gonna lead back to the secondary fear that they'll be rejected. That then follows the diagonal arrow down to their secondary desire. Uh, I guess I better get here. their secondary desire, to develop themselves to be all that they can be. Remember I said, these are people that go to seminars, okay? They go to Tony Robbins. They go to, they go to all of the motivational speakers. They go to church at, at uh, what's the guy's name? That's, huh? Joel, they go to Joel Osteen's church uh, and watch it on television if they, if they think that they're Christians or uh, maybe are Christians but don't understand the Christian life, they, they, you know, they, they want to be everything they can be, okay? That then leads to their, to their attitude of being goal-oriented. I've got to accomplish this in order that what I can be all that I can be. So they'll be ambitious, confident, high-spirited, diligent, focused, persistent, self-invested. These are, these are the people that if you are in an organization, a human organization, this is the way you want them to be. Unfortunately, a lot of churches want these people also. Okay, want these, okay well, you're perfect material to be a deacon or be, a, be an elder. Okay? Um, and their behaviors, always self-improving, always trying to be outstanding, effective, competent, capable communicators, motivating, industrious. But that leads to another fear of falling behind, of being overshadowed by others. You see, being all I can be is not enough. There are other people that are more than I, than I am, so I've got to be in competition to them. That's the fear. I've, 
I'm falling behind. I'm being overshadowed by others. So that then the diagonal arrow down to level four to distinguish themselves from others, to be noticed, valued by others. That's where competition begins to grow. That's, that's the conversation at a gathering where the person, one person says, yeah, I was the, uh, I was the president of our uh, board of directors at our company. And the other person says, I was the chief, uh, chief executive officer and, and the chief operations officer at, at my, or, in my organization when I worked for so-and-so, so-and-so. Competition, you don't wanna be overshadowed by others, become competitive. They always wanna be better than the other person. So you can watch that uh, as a sign, okay? That leads to their attitude of being success-oriented, com uh, comparing, always they are comparing. Uh, anytime you see a person comparing, they are good chance that they're a three and a good chance that they are a level four uh, type three. Okay. They're comparing, they're status conscious. They're, to me, they're, these are the, the arch typical type three, the, the finely dressed, uh, fine car, fine, you know. Uh, where do you want to eat? Well, they want to eat at the place that each meal is a hundred dollars instead of the place where it's where it's twenty dollars, because they have to have that uh, success uh, uh, appearance. Okay, yeah. status conscious, competitive, exclusive, driven, always seeking recognition. Look at me! Look at me! Okay, uh, conciliatory. Their behaviors: performing, achieving career-oriented, self-enhancing, organized, diplomatic, presentable, conforming. But what kind of fear does that lead to? Look all the way over on the right-hand column of losing the positive regard of others. So what's their new desire? To create a favorable impression of themselves, to impress. You see how it's going downhill? Now, now I... My desire is not to be all I can be. Now it's to impress people. So they, their attitude, their image conscious, they're rehearsed. Premeditated. They're impersonal. They're emotionally detached. They're always reading others to see how they can, how they can compete. Uh, they have intimacy problems. They're self-doubting. And the problem that they're trying to get away from is being disengaged. The uh, behaviors, they're expedient. They, they meet expectations. They are like a chameleon. They change colors for the circumstances. They're packaged, efficient, pragmatic, professional, friendly, and complacent is the way they're trying to, the thing they're trying to get away from. So their fear becomes that others will see through them. They will be humiliated and lose face. Why, why would that be? Because they know that they're not all these things, that their behaviors are a mask, that they are a front, that it's, that it's a fake. So they have a fear that others will see through them. They'll be humiliated. They'll lose face. So their new desire is to convince themselves and others of the reality of their image. So they have to work harder at image. They become uh, grandiose in their attitude, self-involved, narcissistic, contemptuous of others that, that they think are in competition with them, arrogant, jealous, secretly needy, unrealistic, behavior, self-promoting, showing off, inflating accomplishments, openly competitive, mocking, sneering, seductive, uh, they have an attitude and they can become placating where they try to please people uh, into believing their, that their image is correct. Okay, so that gives them uh, the fear that they are failing, that their claims are empty and fraudulent. Now they go into the unhealthy stage with the basic desire to preserve the illusion that they are still superior, that they're still okay. 
They can become unprincipled in their attitude, covetous, hostile. They have an inner emptiness, affectless. That means they don't show emotion in their faces. Uh, feeling insignificant, numb. Yeah, uh, behaviors, deceptive, concealing, cutting corners, sur surreptitious, detracting, divisive, and fighting that inadequate feeling, which leads to back to their new fear, level of fear of being caught, of losing any reason for others to think well of them, that there's nothing about them that people will admire. So what do they do? They develop the level eight basic desire to do whatever is necessary to support their false claims while covering their tracks. They become liars, okay? Become liars about what they've accomplished, what they are, who they are, okay? They become uh, in attitude duplicitous. Uh, they have a suppressed panic. They're remorseless, they're desperate. They feel cornered. Uh, they're detached from their self. They're, they're, they feel that they become dissociated. Behaviors, opportunistic, exploitative, betraying people, sabotaging people. So if they're like in a company, uh, uh, they, they are at the level to do whatever is necessary to support their false claims. So if they don't live up to what they're supposed to be doing, who are they going to blame? Are they going to say, oh, I forgot that. I, you know, I, I messed that up. No, they're going to blame somebody else in the company or on the committee or in the church or wherever they are. They're going to blame someone else. They, uh, and they'll sabotage them. They'll betray them, sabotage them. Uh, they're lying. Their fear is to be depersonalized. So uh, they then fear that their falseness and emptiness will be exposed, that they will be ruined. By this point in time, their, their uh, cufflink shirt is fraying around the edges. Uh, their suit is becoming a little outdated, a little old, uh, not, not freshly cleaned and pressed. They're starting physically uh, in their appearance to go downhill. They don't get a haircut. Uh, every week or two, they're starting their hair starting to grow out, and they're starting to look disheveled. Uh, so that uh, fear of being uh, exposed, they go to their new desire to destroy whoever or whatever threatens them or reminds them of what they lack. This is the true psychopath. Uh, they will murder someone. Uh, you've seen it. Uh, uh, well, what's the recent case where the the husband was the big shot lawyer and he shot his wife and son. Why? Because they reminded him of what he lacked. That he was, that they, his son was getting in trouble. And so that was going to, going to be bad news for him. His wife knew about his drug dependency and that was going to ruin him. So what did he have to do? Get rid of him. Okay? Perfectly logical in a psychopath's mind at level nine of a, of a level of a type three. And this guy was a type three. Okay? He actually, they found out, was stealing from other attorneys when they would have work cases together and they would split the fees. He was always the one that got the billing and got the payment. And then he would cheat the other attorneys who had worked on the case. Some of them had done more work than he had done, but he would cheat them because he wanted to look like his self-image of being the best attorney in Florida. Okay. So that's, that's a, he's a good example of being a bad example. Okay. So to destroy whoever, whomever or whatever threatens them, reminds them of what they lack. So they become monomaniacal, malicious, vengeful, sadistic, self-abandoning, uh, and, their, and their behaviors relentless, monstrous, vicious, psychopathic, fragmented, okay? murderous. 
A three is a great person when they're in the, in the top three or four levels because they're always trying to do good to impress others. Okay? But when they go down into the lower levels, you have to watch out for them. They will destroy the, they'll destroy the church to save their own reputation, their own, their own uh, uh, image. Okay, pastor could be a chairman of the deacons, the chief elder, those kind of people. Somebody in the church. And this, I'm speaking of people in the church who are who are religious but are not. They're either not believers or they're believers who have left the Christian spiritual way of life. And uh, what? Jim yeah, Jim Baker, Jimmy Swaggart, all those, all those people that that go downhill uh, because they have an image and they and they they can't live up to it, so they go down and down and down. Uh, the we'll we'll see them as we go through different types and their levels. Okay, so that's the level. Uh, Three, uh, I think you know enough to go ahead and review on your own the four, five, and six that we covered. Did we cover six last week? You don't remember? We did six, okay. So uh, go ahead and review those with what you know about the fear, uh, the, the fear going to the desire, going across and then going back to the new fear. And watch that downward progression of attitudes and behaviors. Go ahead and review those. And then next week, we're going to do seven, eight, nine, and one. I don't care what I have to do. I've got an image to uphold. I'm going to get it done. Okay. Because I've taken three weeks to do what I was going to do in two or maybe four weeks to do what I was going to do in two. So I've got to step it up so we can get through this. I've, I've given you more of what you're going to get uh, with the spiritual aspects when I tie in the uh, fruit of the spirit and all of that to this and Bible doctrine into this. I've given you some of it today, as I pointed out, witnessing the way how you witness the gospel to people like that seeing their faults well you know there's a flip side of that coin seeing our faults in those different levels of deterioration as well and like i said you you may do something that is level six maybe seven into the real unhealthy level you may do that but but you don't have the pattern it's just a, what you could call a one-off. I, when I get stressed, when I get anxious, when I get upset, I go there. Okay. But you know that you go there. So you know that you're not walking by means of the spirit. If you're walking by means of the flesh and you can pretty much, uh, anything below level four is human bad. Okay. Above uh, level four, uh, level four and above is, is pretty much human good. But none of them are spiritual good. We still got to find out how we uh, transition from human good. And it's hard because that's what we've learned our whole lives is how to be a good person. And then we're going to say, wait a minute. How do I go from being a good person to being a good believer in Christ? Okay. Because there's a difference. There's a difference. When you are a believer in Christ, you are in Christ. Uh, you're not, uh, you're, it's not you anymore. I mean, you still have that nature, so you can still fall back into it. And most of us do. And unfortunately, most of us live there all the time uh, and don't live in the spiritual nature very often. We want to change that. We want to change that. We want to put off the old man as soon as we spot him. And that's the whole purpose of the human bad, human good study of the Enneagram, because to me, it reveals our human good and our human bad better than 
any other system of personality typing that I've seen. Okay, well, let's pray and we'll go ahead and uh, bring today to an end so we can start fresh with 7891 next time. And uh, hopefully I'll have it organized well enough that I can bring out more of the, of the uh, spiritual aspect. Well, maybe the witnessing aspects, because I think that's important to be able to see. So when, as you review your, your type four, five, and six, look and see what would be a cue to where this person is in their unbelief, in their, in their non-Christian identity. And how can I take the understanding of their fear and their desire and make it relevant, make the gospel relevant to them? Now that's, to me, that's true highest level apologetics. This, how it relates to them, how their own fears and desires can relate them to God and their need for him. So let's pray. Father, we, uh, Thank you so much that you give us freedom from the human good and the human bad that we see in the Enneagram. We pray that as we see ourselves, that we will put that off with a conscious decision and put on the spirit, put on walking by means of the spirit, put on walking by the fruit of the spirit, by reviewing those teachings that we've had in the past and seeing the difference seeing that human love, human kindness, human, all of the human substitutes for the spiritual are always for our benefit so we can feel loved, so we can feel worthy, so that we can feel successful, that we can feel unique, that we can feel safe. All of those things are all our human motivation, not our spiritual motivation. Our spiritual motivation is always other-centered, not self-centered. We thank you that you can give us that insight through the Spirit, and we ask that you bless the study. Give us opportunity to use what we learn to witness to those who do not have Christ, who are lost, who are without hope, without eternal life, because they are still walking in their humanity and they have fears and desires that God knows and God can use us to bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.